Hello, good evening, everyone. Once again, my name is Ali Hamedi, consultant with TechMill for your Futures webinar series. We're going to be continuing the series this evening and discuss the market outlook within the interest rates uh, and interest rate market outlook, which is very interesting. Coincidentally, uh, tomorrow they'll be announcing the Federal Reserve of the United States. Uh, most likely a hike, but they'll make their announcement tomorrow. We'll get into that further uh, in tonight's webinar. I hope everybody's had a good trading week. It's been uh, very volatile. Uh, as we sit today, markets have opened up in the US to the downside. Uh, the S&P is down 50 points and the Dow 30 is roughly down 220 as we speak uh, with further concerns uh, about the economy in general. Uh, we'll be discussing quite a few topics related to the interest rate environment uh, and the particular outlook uh, and forecast for tomorrow. Uh, without further ado, um, this here gives us a backdrop <clears throat> dating back from the mid-50s, um, what the interest rates, uh, the Fed funds rate. So let, let's clarify what the Fed funds rate is, which is what the Federal Reserve uh, makes their announcement on when they say they're hiking interest rates, they are hiking the Fed funds rate, which is the overnight lending rate that banks lend to each other. That's not the rate that we as consumers receive or get uh, when, it, when we go apply for a loan or a mortgage or anything where we take a line of credit. We get what we call the prime rate plus uh, depending on the type of credit and background you have and depending on what type of loan you're taking. So uh, the Fed funds rate and the interest rate that primarily moves the U.S. economy uh, and has a lot of uh, weight behind it, or the most weight behind it, is the Fed funds rate. And that's uh, what you see here in this chart. Uh, you've seen that spike uh, you know, as Reagan took office, President Reagan and the Volcker rule took effect, uh, where they ended up pushing up interest rates higher than the inflation rate. And then the economy took off afterwards, and then everything kind of settled back down. And then, as you can see this here on the tail on the right end, it's basically been zero since the 08, 09 collapse. You see the sharp decline there. Uh, on this graph, and then um, it spiked a little bit during President Trump's uh, term, uh, and then they brought it back down to zero, and then they started raising interest rates again now uh, due to inflationary concerns. Uh, this particular current contract for July 2022 uh, is a snapshot from yesterday's graph from, uh, from TradingView. Uh, where the ultra U.S. Treasury is the 10-year uh, U.S. 10-year Treasury, which is one of the Treasury bonds, if you will, used as a risk-free rate of return. I'll get into that uh, later as well in tonight's webinar. Uh, but when we say risk-free rate of return, we're talking about there is zero risk and how much interest you will be getting for that zero risk. And uh, the 10-year Treasury has been somewhat volatile this year because of the rate hikes, but it's still, uh, let me just give you right now where it's trading. Pull it up. So bear with me one second and I'll tell you where the 10 year treasury is trading as we speak right now. with me. Let me call this organized here. Yeah, it's trading it. 
two spot seven six percent. So uh, apologies for the little delay there, but at two seventy six, you know that's telling us you you're able to receive two point seven six percent return or interest for ten years for zero risk. Okay, and um, so that's why they call it the risk free rate of return. And this was the snapshot of the current contract for the 10 year or the, what they call the ultra in the futures market uh, was trading yesterday at 156.17. And then if we look at the December end of this year, basically what, six months out, five months out, it's, it was trading yesterday at 150, 157 spot 19. And if we take it out just a bit further through the end of Q1 in 2023, March, it's trading also at one, as of yesterday, it was trading 157.19. So uh, neither here nor there, we're going to get into the discussion of what this particular number means, uh, not only for the actual futures market itself, but how it affects everything else uh, in general. So from June's 2022, which is, last month when they announced the 75 basis point rate hike last month they obviously had their meeting and then they made their announcement now during each meeting uh they have a recorded log of the meeting called the minutes and they always release the minutes of the fomc meeting with a lag so they release it two to three maximum four weeks after the meeting uh, has taken place so tomorrow when they make the announcement for the rate hike before they make the announcement they have their meeting but they will release those meeting uh, meetings uh, minutes sorry for tomorrow's meeting at some point in time by august mid-august august 17th so uh this was coming from last month's fomc's meeting announcement and the fed policymakers continue to anticipate that ongoing increases in the Fed funds rate would be appropriate and backed a 50 to a 75 basis point hike in July, which would be announced tomorrow. Officials also noted that the US economic outlook warranted moving to a restrictive stance of policy, and they recognized the possibility that an even more restrictive stance could be appropriate if elevated inflation pressures were to persist. Now, what has happened with the inflationary number. The CPI number came out at 9.1. Uh, that's the quote unquote official uh, rate of inflation at the moment. You had forecasts from economists that were perceiving it to be lower than 8.6, which was the previous number, and some forecasting it uh, to stay the same, but it actually came in higher than most expected, which means inflation is still on the upswing or up, upward trend. They also noted that policy firming could slow economic growth for a time, but they saw the return of inflation to 2% as critical to achieving maximum employment on a sustained basis. Uh, July 27th, which is tomorrow, is the date that the Fed will announce their interest rate decision, and interest rates are already at one and three quarters percent, and the market is anticipating a 75 basis point increase or 0.75% to push it up to two and a half percent. So now the 2% has always been, let's say the Fed's benchmark to keep inflation in check, but in all reality to achieve 2% and they're chasing the inflation number now where the official inflation number is at 9.1% where real inflation could in, uh, realistically be north of 12, maybe 12 and a half percent. Um, it's going to take a lot of time. Uh, you know, if you think about it, one of the only ways uh, uh, rationally from an economic perspective for it to bring inflation down the interest rate, interest rates need to be tighter or higher than the rate of inflation. And then, you know, that's going back to the uh, US uh, President Ronald Reagan's administration is what the Volcker rule did. They increased interest rates uh, to the point where they were higher than the rate of inflation. So that meant it was costlier to borrow money. It was tighter, restrict, uh, tighter restrictive economic policy. And they, at the same time, increased supply. 
So if you restrict the money but increase supply, uh, in theory, if you have more supply of product, the price will naturally come down, which brings down the rate of inflation. And if you have a restrictive money policy where it's not so easy to borrow or give out cash like they've been doing or the US has been doing for the last couple of years, um, it also makes it more difficult for, uh, let's say, consumers to go out and borrow. If they're getting money for free, they're not going to go work. There's no incentive to work uh, because they're getting the handout. And then at the same time, if they're not working, then the GDP slows. And then you can see how that affects uh, the economy in a vicious circle. So if nobody is working, but they're getting cash uh, and spending it freely in the market, which is propping up the markets uh, like a house of cards, so to speak, and they're not working, they're receiving this. Uh, so they're not really providing any output. They're only receiving cash. So that means companies are not reaching the full capacity of employment. Uh, that means more, more and more people are less inclined to work because they're receiving a handout. And then at the same time, uh, when that happens from a corporate standpoint, you produce less. And if you produce less, that in natural uh, cases is going to decline your rate of production uh, and therefore decreases the GDP of the nation uh, wherever the corporation is from. Uh, in this instance, the United States. So right now, the market is, is already priced in. Now, that, now, they've priced in a 75 basis point increase uh, for tomorrow's announcement. So if anything comes in, let's say less or more than the 75 basis point announcement, uh, then it's going to create more, uh, more of a significant ripple effect across all markets. Uh, if it comes out one point higher, uh, 1%, or if it comes out 50, point, uh, 50 basis point height versus the 75 basis point height. But it's priced in. Uh, already at 75 basis points uh, for an overall 2.5% Fed funds rate, uh, effectively. Uh, from tradingeconomics.com, interest rates in the U.S. are expected to be at one and three quarters by the end of this quarter, which they were correct because um, uh, Q2 ended last month. And uh, according to trading economics, global macro models, and analyst expectations, their long-term for the US fund, Fed funds rate is projected to trend around 3.75% in 2023. Well, if tomorrow's announcement is accurate and it's increased 75 basis points and we get to 2.5%, uh, this particular analytical forecast from trading economics, uh, uh, they are saying that there's still one and a quarter, uh, 125 basis points to go. Uh, going into 2023. So that could be one big rate hike between now and the end of the year. That could be two separate rate hikes, um, however you want to dice it up. But uh, at 3.75% uh, being their forecast or their projection uh, for 2023, um, based on everything that's happening in the markets, uh, could be a bit conservative, uh, in my opinion. From CNBC.com, the federal, and now we're going to get here, we're going to discuss uh, several layers of the uh, uh, importance of this particular rate and how it affects not just the markets, but everything else around it. Um, the Federal Reserve likely will raise its target federal funds rate by another 75 basis points at its meeting this week. Now, they also are forecasting a 75 basis points hike. And how will this affect, how will this increase will affect you uh, from an investor standpoint and also from a consumer standpoint? Any increase by the Fed will correspond with a hike in the prime rate, which I referred or alluded to uh, at the beginning of the webinar. And that's what consumers receive prime rate plus, it could be like prime rate plus LIBOR, 
uh, or prime rate plus an added specific, uh, let's say one, two, three percentage points on top of the prime rate for depending on what type of line of credit you are applying for. Uh, so that will increase the prime rate, sending financing costs higher for many types of consumer loans. Now, short term borrowing costs or rates uh, will be the first to jump and credit cards. Uh, there's a direct connection to the Fed's benchmark. So Fed rates increase the prime rates, which we just discussed, which in turn increases variable rates. According to Wallet Hub, factoring in the Fed hike, uh, the Fed hikes from March, May, June, and now July, credit card users will wind up paying around 12.9 to 14 and a half billion with a B US dollars more in 2022 this year than they would have if those increases had not occurred. That's a very large sum of money coming only from the credit card sector. Uh, adjustable rate mortgages, HELOCs, which is short for home equity lines of credit, car loans, etc. Those will also become more expensive. The interest rates will become higher for the consumer to borrow money. Uh, so this is where having uh, a good credit, a, a good credit history, and uh, let's say good earning potential will help keep your rates lower than someone with a lower credit score or less earning potential. Those, those types of lender or uh, uh, loans will have a higher uh, interest rate on them. Uh, anyone looking for a new loan can expect, expect to pay more. Uh, student loans for U.S. universities. Uh, the U.S. Congress sets the rate for the fed federal student loans every May of each year uh, before the upcoming academic year, and they also base it on the 10-year Treasury, which I alluded to also earlier at the beginning of the uh, webinar, and uh, the new rate goes into effect every July. So the rate that they set for uh, uh, student loans was set in May of this year for this upcoming 2022-2023 academic year, and it goes into effect or went into effect this month, July. And what happens between now and May of 2023 with the Fed funds rate, right now it's increasing as we just alluded to and discussed, um, it will therefore affect what rate students will be taking loans out to pay for their uh, university education, which will be higher next year from the ones that took out uh, federal loans this year, which the ones that took out this year are paying more than the ones that took out last year. Uh, savings accounts. Uh, interest rates on savings accounts are on the rise after consecutive hikes. So you think, okay, this is a good thing. Even though savings accounts will be paying you more in interest, it won't mean much since inflation is at 9.1% officially and even higher unofficially. So what that gap means is erosion of capital. If uh, the official inflation rate is at 9.1% and let's just say savings accounts with tomorrow's, if it's accurate, assuming that it is a 75 race basis point hike tomorrow, and now the Fed fund overnight rate is two and a half percent, now prime rate increases. Uh, so now let's just say you can get a savings account paying you, let's just 3% on APR uh, from a, a savings account in the bank. Well, you're getting 3%, which is better than it was in the previous years because it's been basically zero. But with inflation at 9.1%, you've got 6% or more uh, loss of purchasing power or erosion of capital. So it's not necessarily a good thing, but you know, when you have cash sitting in a bank and you're in this type of situation, Obviously, earning as much as you can is better than earning nothing, but you always have to keep a pulse on inflation and how do you hedge against that or how do you take advantage of these types of market situations and volatility. From ICIS.com, this, this came out in March of 2021. So we're almost uh, a year and a half, 15, 16 months ago, okay? Uh, and here is 
what they had to say at that point in time. And I, the reason I pulled it out from a year and a half ago will let you see how important it is or the importance of being able to dissect what sector you wanna be investing in and or trading in, and at the same time, how to do uh, in-depth research on what it is that you are specifically investing or trading in. The key risk in the financial markets uh, is in the financial markets, sorry, the key risk is in the financial markets since investors assume now that central banks will never let markets fall. Now this goes back to the, the slogan, too big to fail uh, from the 08 collapse after Lehman Brothers uh, collapsed, then they didn't let any other financial institution uh, uh, file bankruptcy or go out of business. So every step of the way, they've made access to money much easier. And any institution that's in trouble has been able to find a way with their respective governments, uh, you know, i.e. Greece within the EU in 2012, uh, the ECB, European Central Bank, didn't let them fail, but they also had to comply with what the ECB wanted in order for them to get the bailout that Greece needed in order to maintain status quo within the EU. Um, under US President Biden's term, his administration is focused on jobs rather than stock markets. And as a result, the Federal Reserve is now hoping to see higher rates and inflation as a sign of economic recovery. Now, in my opinion, they're getting it backwards. And I'm bringing this up now because this was stated back in March of 2021. Now, here we fast forward 15, 16 months and look at the situation we're in. Okay, unemployment rate is still low, but inflation is out of control and the interest rates are trying to catch up. And now it's a catch-22 situation. The danger in, in all market downturns, which is where we, what we are in right now, uh, is that selling becomes a soul self-fulfilling uh, as realism returns. So what I'm getting at there is, or what they're getting at is they're realizing, okay, we need to get out because the market is going down and the reality of it is not as good as the administration has made it out to be, even though unemployment rate is low. Uh, the reality is inflation is high and interest rates are, are in, increasing. The key risk is focused uh, on the likely response from ETFs, those are exchange traded funds and high frequency, high frequency traders, since they are buying when prices move higher and selling when prices move lower, so that when investors are loaded up on margin, they all rush to buy. And when the margin calls come in, the investors are all forced to sell in a hurry. So it's almost like a herd mentality when they see a bear, a bull trap and they see the market go up, they end up buying at the high, and then they see the market falling down again, they end up selling at the low, and that cycle repeats itself uh, due to lack of experience or uh, thinking that trading is quote unquote easy or investing is easy when uh, it does require some adequate research and knowledge of what you're doing. The end result, according to this article from ICIS, is that they will have a bubble-free market driven by earnings and analysis rather than momentum and stock market cheerleaders. But, it's, uh, but it will likely take a few years to unwind the damage that has been done over the past 20 years. So they, back in March, 2021, according to their synopsis, is that this would create no more bubbles in the market, it will be driven purely by statistic or statistical analysis on how well the actual company is doing and their earnings per share, uh, what market sector they're in, how healthy the sector is in. And if the company is a good company, it will be driven by uh, good investment cash versus the pump and dump. Uh, you know, I'm sure everyone's heard of Wall Street bets uh, uh, from the Reddit line. Uh, where you've, you, know, you had AMC and you had, um, the name just skipped my mind, but uh, you had AMC and you had uh, GameStop. 
uh, stock where people were just pumping in because people were short selling. And, you know, that is a very, very dangerous game. That, that is pure speculation. That is not proper uh, investing, if you will. And, but that's what they're uh, getting at is that it would create a bubble free market. Now, the reality check, if we fast forward to where we are today, is that inflation is now considered to be considerably high and possibly uncontrollable and rates have been increasing this year and are still forecasted to increase and the markets have been taking a beating. Now, if we look at year to date, um, year to date, the S&P 500, as we speak today, is down 18 uh, and a quarter percent. So roughly almost 20% down year to date and markets down today again. So uh, markets are taking a beating. Inflation is high, possibly not controllable. Uh, interest rates are increasing uh, incrementally, um, but not high or fast or hard enough to make a dent uh, in the actual inflationary cycle that we're in. And uh, it goes back to where you're seeing people getting out of the markets so selling at the wrong time um, uh, because they're headline investors, they're market cheerleaders, this is what they're getting at. From worldpoliticsreview.com, um, it's a widely acknowledged truth that when the US economy sneezes, many countries catch a cold. Now, that's, a, that's a joke, but the US economy is the largest economy in the world and they are the market drivers and they are in the driving seat, driver's seat and again with this week's interest rate hike by the fed is sure to create new problems for already battered economies and families in less affluent countries the move will un unintentionally pile on uh, onto the multiple interconnected crises and growing challenges already facing developing countries you know i.e the russia ukraine conflict and then issues, uh, political issues from Peru all the way to Sri Lanka, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, this should, if, you, if you're looking at it from a holistic approach, not purely from what the interest rate's going to be and how you're going to trade the interest rate on tomorrow's announcement is where are the opportunities based on this number that's coming out tomorrow and where the Fed rate is going and where it's headed, uh, where are the opportunities in the market and understand how to use futures to your benefit in these types of situations. This is, what, this is why I put this particular slide in here so that this is more than just the interest rate number that the Federal Reserve is coming out with. It's got very big ramifications, very big, uh, 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 consequences, negative and or positive uh, for global economies. And how are you able to protect what you're currently investing in? Um, is it affected? Is the what you're currently invested in? Will the interest rate uh, affect your current portfolio? Most likely in some way, one way or another. This is where you're going to have to understand what you're invested in or trading in. And know how to either hedge and protect what you currently have within your portfolio. And at the same time, if you are starting to build your portfolio, understand the dynamics that are coming into play and being able to come up with your own strategy uh, and, and say, okay, here is my strategy. I've done my research and based on one, two, three, I'm gonna take positions one, two, three and let the market play out. Um, you can see here the chart that I've included here. Uh, this is the interest rate chart, and you can look at it from basically from 08, 09, all the way up through 2016. This is when it went up briefly under the Trump administration. Then it came back down and has been basically flatlined like it was prior to 2016. And then this year has started to increase. So if you look at 
2018, 19, and 20, et cetera, you'll see it come back down. And then in 2022, you'll see it to come back and it's gonna be higher. It's gonna be up in here. It's, it's broken the 2% level. So you can see where the trend is headed uh, with the interest rates out of the Federal Reserve. Now, getting back to treasury bonds, uh, remember I was talking about the risk-free rate of return. Uh, the U.S. treasuries have multiple maturities. And so you have treasury notes. Those, are, those tend to be less than uh, one year in maturity. And then you have bonds that are longer than one year. So you've got a one month, a two month, a three month, a six month, et cetera, treasury notes. And then you've got the three year, the two, the two year, the three year, the 10 year, the 30 year, you've got a 20 year, you've got a, 50, a 15 year uh, treasury bonds. So how is the Fed funds rate compared to the risk-free rate of return? And I know there's a lot of colors on this particular screen, but the Fed funds rate is the red one. And going back to the mid fifties, if you just track it along, you see it spike here. And you can see that it went above the risk-free rate of return because they were tackling inflation at that point in time. Inflation was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, 12, 13%, maybe even higher, but it was in, in the teens, double digits. And so the Fed funds rate increased and they brought inflation back into check. And you can see it down trend until uh, it, it flatlined basically in 09 as it, they brought them back down to zero. And here's that spike under the uh, Trump presidency. They brought it back down. And now you can see it start to tail back up. Uh, but here's the thing. Under Trump, when it was spiking, he was against it because he was more business-minded from an economic perspective. Um, I'm not here to say I'm pro or against any president. I'm just giving you the mindset uh, from that particular administration was their, where their focus was. And this particular administration's focus is completely different and or the opposite of the prior or previous administration's uh, mindset when it comes to the markets, the economy, uh, tax rates, et cetera, et cetera, which all uh, have come into a very, head again to a very nasty storm, in my opinion, with inflation, interest rates increasing, uh, raw materials getting into the commodities that we've discussed earlier have increased um, uh, geopolitical tension and then supply chain disruptions, not being able to uh, properly, let's say, analyze the valuation of a particular sector or stock due to these disruptions uh, end up causing ramifications on the bottom line on investors. Now, uses for treasury futures, you know, how can we use them within our portfolio? Well, you can hedge against fixed income or bond portfolios. Fixed income and bonds are synonymous. They're the same thing. Bonds means fixed income and fixed income market is the bond market. Um, or you can speculate on the interest rate markets. Now, with U.S. treasuries, the, mainly the 10-year uh, is the bench. They're, they are all used, but mainly the 10 years used as the risk-free rate of return. So any increase or de decrease in rates from the Federal Reserve will cause volatility that traders and investors need to prepare for or speculate on. So depending on what you're doing, if, you're, if you currently have something in play or in place, like a retirement account uh, where you have uh, uh, investments in fixed income because you're limited I'm giving an example. So from a pension plan perspective, uh, you're looking at or retirement accounts where the closer you get to retirement, the more allocation you have towards fixed income. But what happens to fixed income in this type of environment? It's going to get slaughtered. Why? Because interest rates are increasing. So it's coming costlier to issue new debt from a corporate or a corporation or governmental standpoint. And at the same time, as an investor standpoint, they, all, they want the higher coupon or the higher interest rate. So why would I hold a bond with a lower coupon when I can own a new bond with a higher coupon? So they end up selling the old for the new and the price of the old drops, which is what a lot of the pension funds uh, and fixed income bond uh, holders at the moment currently have. 
those will be dropping in price in anticipation for higher uh, paying coupons and new newly issued debt. So they would need to take a hedge. This is one use that they can, uh, uh, let's say, I don't want to say play in, but invest and, and use as a tool to hedge against. Speculation is speculation. We don't need to discuss that any further. Um, the, the market is currently pricing in. I talked about that earlier, that it is going to be 75 basis points tomorrow. Now, it can be anything. And the Fed can come out at any point in time. They're not held accountable to any specific day or time to when they can or can't increase rates. They could come out today, literally, while I'm speaking right now, and say, we just increased the Fed funds rate one percentage point. And they could still come out tomorrow and raise it 75 basis points. And they could do that again the following. They can do whatever they want and raise or decrease their, their rates however they want, according to their policy, what they find feasible for whom, which is their only concern is the US economy. But the market has priced in 75 basis points. So anything different than that, we'll see more volatility than expected. The key takeaways from this evening's webinar and the market overview, uh, US interest rates are dictated by the Fed. And I just, as I just said, they're focused on the US market. They have huge ramifications on the rest of the world's central banks and economies. So this is an opportunity for you to look at different possible sectors, uh, regardless of what it may be, whether it's currency, whether it's stock, whether it's commodities, and, and see, historically speaking, what's happened in times of high inflationary cycles out of the United States and in times of uh, increased Fed funds rate uh, environments, what sectors have done well, what sectors have done poorly, and then invest or act accordingly based on your research. Um, any move will cause the markets to react. So depending on your portfolio uh, or investment strategy, that will decide what position you take in the futures market, whether you're hedging or speculating. Again, you've got to research how an interest rate hike or decrease decision will affect your portfolio and take the calculated decision to protect your positions. Now, uh, this is, I mentioned at the beginning, August 17th is the date where tomorrow's announcement, they'll come out with the, their rate decision. Okay, so let's just say it is 75 basis points. They'll come out tomorrow and say, the Fed funds rate has increased to 75 basis point, which is now at two and a half percent. And then on August 17th, is when they will release the minutes, what was discussed in the meeting tomorrow, they will release them on August 17th. And what is mentioned in this meeting or the minutes uh, is what they are discussing, what they are calculating for the future moving forward uh, in regards to the interest rates. This is where they will provide, uh, I'll call it intel, but more guidance of how many more hikes they may have or not have for the remainder of the year, how much further they intend to go or push up interest rates for 2022. They very rarely go beyond uh, very small timeframes, quarter to quarter. Uh, they Now they might extend it to 2022, the end of 2022, but they're not gonna come out FOMC and say, you know, we're forecasting, you know, by end of 2023, uh, you know, the, the Fed funds rate to be at 5%. They're not going to do that. Uh, they keep things uh, discreet and incremental as possible so that they try to keep a control on uh, what they what they can control and what they're doing. And I like to leave each webinar with a quote. Uh, you make most of your money in a bear market. You just don't realize it at the time. This comes from Shelby C. Davis, an American philanthropist and retired money manager. And uh, it's easy to make money when the market is moving in one direction, like it has been, let's say, for the better of the last decade, okay, or slightly more. Since 2009 onwards, we've had really only one uh, down year uh, in the market. So uh, everybody can be a champion or, or uh, let's say, a great uh, investor, per se, in good years. But if you understand the dynamics of 
what the interest rates are, the ramifications they have on the markets and the global economies, and understand that we are heading into a recession. You know, and recession is defined as two negative, uh, two negative growth quarters, success, successive growth quarters, which has happened. So we could say we're officially in a recession now. Um, the market's been declining. Market year to date is down roughly 20%. Now is not the time to be fearful. Now is the time to be an intelligent investor and in understanding the dynamics, being able to find pieces that you find attractive, uh, that you find interesting for yourself, what you wanna be trading and investing in and doing your due diligence, uh, using history uh, as, as a lesson and reading up and understanding how uh, things played out in the past, understanding that we're in uncharted territory now, uh, but there are a lot of similarities uh, from specific periods in the U.S. market's history uh, when it comes to inflation and the interest rate environment. Uh, and we're, get, we're in bear market territory as we speak. So, uh, you know, if you are an investor for the long term, you're welcoming, you're welcoming this storm that we're heading into with open arms. If you're a day trader and speculating and really just clicking the button and not knowing what you're doing, it's very, very dangerous. And, uh, you know, the losses will mount up. So, you know, heed my warning and understand, you know, that futures are more for the sophisticated investor, but the markets right now, aside from the futures market, are very volatile. So uh, getting in and making a few clicks or listening to uh, recommendations here and there uh, and thinking that it's gonna pan out and it's gonna make you, you know, a quick buck or two, you've gotta be, you've gotta be very, very respectful of the market and rely on yourself and only yourself uh, and what you can do uh, with your research. Uh, with that, I'm going to open it up for any questions. If anybody has any questions, you're welcome to send it through the chat uh, now. Any questions? Going once, going twice. Okay. For those of you in attendance and will be watching this later on uh, Ticknell's YouTube, uh, platform. Uh, pay attention to tomorrow's decision as they will be making that announcement early afternoon U.S. time and uh, see how the markets react. Uh, I hope you are taking the necessary measures within your portfolios. If not, and you're still in the learning phase, this is great. Uh, we have a question come in from Musa. Gold prices. Gold prices as we speak right now. Gold is trading currently at 17.16. It's down at $2.90 on the day. Um, uh, we discussed gold earlier, uh, maybe two, two webinars ago, uh, on their mar market outlook and going off of uh, my memory. So don't hold me accountable to this, Musa. But um, we had ranges from uh, several different. Uh, the, okay, so the effective. Uh, you mean the expected effect on gold prices. So uh, gold, usually when things become more expensive in an inflationary cycle uh, and you see the markets drop like they have been, they have what they call flight to safety. And flight to safety is investor money moving from the risky assets, risk on, to risk off assets. And gold is considered a risk off asset um, but it has been volatile this year due to uh, inflation. Now, inflation, you have to keep in consideration, has been affecting the commodities market across the board. Wheat, uh, just as of yesterday, or yeah, it was yesterday or day before because of a, 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 a missile strike, the wheat spiked. I mean, who can forecast that? Uh, but 
I, that was discussed last week when I was talking about corn and the previous week with wheat when we were talking about the ag sector and when we were talking about the metals and gold. Um, if interest rates are gonna increase, that means if we think about it rationally, okay, call it borrowing money to put into the markets is gonna become more expensive. So people are going to now feel like, okay, market's taken a beating, which it has been. Uh, the markets may be green tomorrow because they may be, uh, the expectation may be spot on at 75 basis points. And then you're going to have the risk on factor turn back on and say, you know what, inflation is going to be under control. The Fed knows what they're doing and blah, 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 blah. And you can have these spikes in the market. Me personally, my personal opinion, um, I feel that it, we are in a downward trend. We're going to have bull traps, several of them along the way and uh, risk is going to get turned off. And when that happens, I can see uh, a spike in gold prices because gold has always been gold throughout civilization and its history. Um, that's the same that goes for silver. Silver is uh, very, very undervalued and compared uh, when you compare it to gold, uh, but you're specifically asking about gold. Um, and I'm giving you a, an outlook. I can't tell you that it's going to tomorrow go from, you know, 1760. It's going to spike up 50 points tomorrow and close at 17, you know, 70 or 1765 or vice versa. Uh, but um, the more that risk on is shifted to risk off, they're going to be avoiding and they're going to be getting out of fixed income as well. Where are they going to go? And gold is, is one of those, quote unquote, safe havens when risk is turned off. Any other questions? I hope that helped you, Musa. Okay, uh, next week's seminar, I'll be discussing the S&P 500, uh, which is the standard and poor uh, index, which contains 500 largest US companies and corporations in the U.S. market and its futures and its outlook. Uh, so stay aware, uh, stay focused, uh, do your research. There's no rush uh, to do anything irrational and uh, make sure you come up with something that you're comfortable with and or protecting what you currently have. And I'll leave it there. Best of luck to everyone. And I will see everyone next week. Have a great week and good evening.